Hello lovely people, I'm K3N and welcome to my channel. Um, in this video I'm going to talk about my stitch meditation scrolls and I've got some of them in this little bag to show you. Um, talk about that one in a minute. So while I unpack them, let me just tell you basically what they are is when I have a little empty um, reel of some kind I, um, this one's actually on a wooden clothes peg, I get myself a long strip of a background cloth, of a bit of old sheet usually, and then onto there I invisibly baste stitch, which I'll show you in a bit if you don't know that, lots of little tiny scraps of cloth. So it's all those little tiny scraps of cloth that are maybe too tiny to use in other ways. Um, and then once they're all basted on, there's a great big one, I um, then can sit with them of an evening or an afternoon or, you know, whenever. Here's one that's basted but I haven't yet done any stitching over. And just stitch onto them. And um, it's very relaxing and therapeutic. And in general I just stitch long straight lines. On this one, because it was a bit bigger, shall I get myself a tiny bit of room? I actually stitched in both directions. This one I've just tied round with a bit of, you know, my cloth twiny twine. Just to sh can you see? Can you see? You can see. This one I stitched long ways and then I went back and stitched crossways. And in general I pretty much only do running stitch. Just because I find that the most meditat meditative. Um, but there you see if there's a little edge sometimes I just throw in some um, overcast stitches and I use all kinds of different coloured threads you see here it's no longer going crossways there's a little heart so I left it unstitched I use all kinds of different coloured threads and I'll show you in a minute my what I call my thread nest and even the threads are all the bits and bobs that are left ends of skeins or if you've stitched a bit and um, you know you've got a decent length left then that gets thrown in the thread nest. This one I haven't attached. Sometimes I attach them, sometimes I don't. Um, but that one, because I still want to do some more cross stitching, cross waist stitching on it, it's easier to work without the, the scroll attached. Put that one to one side. Um, and when they're completely done, stitched, then I have different ways of closing them up. So this one's got a bit of lace around it, which you'll recognize if you saw the um, stitch journal video. It's a bit of that same lace. So it's just more of the same basically, you know. Do you see even really odd shaped scraps, a bit of selvage, because it said 100%, I just liked it. A bit of lace. Um, some people make these and they're called snippet rolls and they make something very similar with the intention then of if you wanted something like, say, that bit there you could put that on the edge of something, on the edge of a journal cover or, you know, onto another piece that you were making. So they make them with the purpose of cutting bits out to use. You can do that as well, absolutely you can. But this for me is purely about the the process of making them. And this one I do think I, yes, you see I've, at the end, because it was a peg, I made a little sleeve on the end and slid it on. I won't roll them all back up, it's going to take me hours, I'll do that later. <coughs> um, this one I put a little button on. This was a cotton reel, a silco wooden cotton reel that was empty. And I did a very rudimentary buttonhole. I just literally cut a little slit in the cloth and overcast around, even there with two different colours of green, I see. So that's that one, with the little button. Um, these are, like I said, they're basted but not yet stitched. So often I'll just baste them and then put them in the bag and then I can just put my hand in the bag almost like a lucky dip, see what one comes out and um, just start stitching away on them. This one I had this big old vintage hook and eye so I used that as a closure. Um, this one hasn't got a closure yet. I might do a closure on this later on in this video. Um, I thought of, I've got this lovely shanky shank button you know, with the shank. thought I might stitch that on, because it's green on green, and make a little twisty twine with this and make a loop. Well, 
so maybe I'll do that a bit later if it doesn't get too long. Um, this is a very special one to me because this are, these are pieces of um, my dad's shirts. I lost my dad in 2019, just before Covid. And these are all little strips of his silk shirt. He liked a snazzy silk shirt, did my dad. Um, so on this is only his shirts and then there's some blue was his favourite colour, that's a bit of indigo dyed sheet. And there I'm stitching only in blue, only I've done one red line up the middle. And this I actually put the pieces on by weaving, cloth weaving, which will be one of the projects we'll do next year, the weekly, the weekly slow stitch projects. If you want to know more about that, if you have a look at the slow stitch and introduction video, I talk about that there. You haven't seen that yet, so that's my daddy's shirts. And that's another great big one basted and ready to stitch on. So you get the idea. <clears throat> um, so I've got this little wooden spool. Just apologise for my hands. It's winter here in this side of the planet, and um, I get I have that hand cream on, but apparently not enough. Um, this has got Bradford on it, which is where my Auntie Lily was from. So this is, to me, a special little wooden spool. So I thought I'd start make a start on this today, just to show you. So I've torn a bit of sheet, which is, I measured it before, roughly, it's about five feet long. Uh, what's that, about a metre and a half, something like that, if you're metric. Uh, it's just some sheet that's very fine, because I'm going to stitch more fabric onto the top of it. I don't want it to get too thick to go around the scroll. And I've dipped it in tea. All I did was just dunk a great big lump. Here's the lump that I've been working from in um, some strong tea, left it for a while, and then uh, I think overnight, and then took it out, gave it a good rinse. I put a little bit of bicarb in the rinsing water because tea is quite acidic, just to neutralize the acid. I don't know if that really works chemically or not, but I do it anyway. Um, so that's just to give it a slightly nicer colour. So I've tear my strip, just the width of the whatever I'm going to put it on to. See, it just sits nicely in there. Um, and then I have selected here out of my scraps, I thought I'd do sort of neutrals, because I was looking at the backs of these, and I quite liked the look of all the different colour stitching against the, the cream background. So I thought, well, why not do um, a scroll in neutrals with the different coloured stitching? And here is my Vimto tin. Vimto, if you don't know, is, uh, I think you still get it, it's a fruit cordial type drink that my grandmother always used to buy for us kids. I think this is a fairly modern tin, but it's retro. And I got it, believe it or not, here in France on a brocante. Um, and in there, is a thread nest. I've got bigger thread nests, but in this little tin I just put um, a little selection. So these are just little ends of embroidery floss and um, some other bits and bobs, and that's what I use. I feel as well that because this is leftovers, that it makes the whole, the materials for the whole thing are all, not waste, because I don't waste anything, but you know what I mean, you know what I mean. I'm not using anything brand, brand new, or anything that would be useful. I keep doing air quotes somewhere else. So my thread nest. <clears throat> so then all I'll do, and I'll just, I'll do a length. I'm not gonna do the whole five feet because that would literally, literally take me days. Um, so all I do then, make sure I'm in shot. Give myself some room because they've exploded all over my desk. Go over there. Oh, and also at the end of this video, I will show you, I talked in my set part two of my stitch journal, uh, making a stitch journal video about a scroll of sheet darns, of old sheets that I was given a little while ago. I'll show you that at the end. Don't let me forget. If I forget, shout, shout at me. Okay, so all I do, I lay my thing down. Usually I'm doing this downstairs on my knee. And then I just get, and these little, these long thin strips are very handy to use and I just lay them on. And I don't really worry too much about covering everything in my first pass, so to speak. And I may or may not put some pins in. I might just put a couple of pins, because that's quite a long bit. Oops. In fact, I'm, that's so long, I'm going to cut it a bit shorter. I'll maybe use that bit later. 
put another pin up there. And the whole process I find satisfying, but the best bit is when you've got your long length with all your bits basted on. And then and that's why I make several of them. And then you can just sit with your thread nest and a needle and um, stitch on it. Just stitch, just stitch for the sake of stitching. So I'm overlapping, but you know, it doesn't really matter. There's no, it's basically the same technique as in the cloth pouch video, the, the collaging, collaging. I always feel a bit pretentious when I say that, but you know, you couldn't really say college, could you? Because that's something else. Um, just have a dig in my scraps. Let's see, that's got a nice fluffy edge. You know I like my fluffy edges. I'm going to put that along there. That's a bit too much. Again, I'm going to cut some off. I brought my decent scissors upstairs with me. In the last video I was moaning about my scissors all the time. So I'll just... Um, that's not going to stay down because it's all bent, but it doesn't matter. He'll stay in a minute when I stitch him. Stay. Sit and stay. Oh, that's a nice bit of selvage with some fluff. Although now, you see, I now start thinking, oh, I've got a brown line and a white line, and do I like that? No, I want something light coloured, because there's too much darkness going on there. Mm, that's, got, that's got stitching still in it. That's obviously been ripped off something. Should we put that on there? Should we just put it on there with its stitching? So you can just play, just play and enjoy. Again, I'm going to cut it, cut it, cut it. Uh, cut it up there. I don't want the two ends to be in the same place. That's just me. I like things to be staggered. I've covered a pin up now. Um, and now I'm going to put this dark bit the other side just to make the darkness go from side to side. You get the idea. You get the idea? And um, call that done for now. So probably what I'd do is I'd, I'd pin on a length-ish, you know, I won't, do, I won't pin the whole thing and then go back and base the whole thing. You can do that if you like, but that's too much pinning in one go for my taste. I want to get stitching. And here I've just got some, it's just vintage machine cotton, which I like to use for basting. Excuse me while I lick my end. Thread my needle. Go on in you go. And pull off a length. Got a little nick. It's not a hugely pretty spool, this one. I don't know if he will be... <coughs> oh, excuse me. <coughs> I don't know if he'll be immortalised as a stitch meditation scroll when his threads run out. Um, a little tip, if you've got a particularly lovely spool, a vintage, you know, a vintage spool with loads of thread on and you can't wait, you can't wait till you've actually used it up. I think it was this one I had, it's a Clark & Co from Paisley, that was lovely and it's got its, um, its labels are intact except for the hole where someone's put it on the, not me, on the spike of their sewing machine. I had loads of, I used to do free machine embroidery and I had loads and loads of bobbins. So I wound it all off onto bobbins. <laughs> so I've got a whole box full of bobbins with that thread on because I wanted the spool. It's just a little tip if you've got lots of bobbins. So to do invisible baste, and this is just to hold it all on so you're not working with pins. You could absolutely just go straight into the decorative stitching with the pins in place, but I don't like that. I like it to be all held down with no pins. So uh, you see, sorry, stop rabbiting about pins and tell them the stitching. So you take a teeny tiny back stitch on the front and then a big stitch on the back. And I'm just going down the middle of that little strip just to hold it there so it doesn't need a pin basically. Basically, how many times is she gonna say basically? So a teeny tiny, can you see? Can I get up in your face? Teeny tiny back stitch, like two or three threads of the cloth. And then on the back I'm going about, what's that, about half, three quarters of an inch. doesn't really matter. And then you get, of course, tangled up because it's so small and fiddly. 
I thought do a small one because then you can you know actually get some done to show but it makes it a bit more fiddly so I just work my way along and sometimes even if I've certainly if I've got a wider strip I'll just go down one edge putting bits on so it might be the whole width or not quite the whole width or whatever and then just come back and fill in you know do you know what I mean so you don't have to cover every square inch of it on your first pass you can just go over and over and if you don't have loads of scraps you could start one with your little scraps and then as you get more scraps add them to it you know as you go along it could be just an ongoing little project for holding your scraps and then you can just keep it as a, a thing in its own right or you can use it, cut it up and, and stitch it onto other things. Up to you. I'm just here to give you the ideas and the jumping off points. Oops, and to get knots in my thread. There we go. <clears throat> I should have maybe brought you in a bit lower so that I didn't have to hold it in midair. But I knew I needed a bit of room in the shot for all that. Gubbins I just showed you. So when I've got to the end of that little dark bit I shall turn around and go back the other way down the other bits. But you could absolutely, you know, go from side to side. The only purpose of this is to anchor everything down and get the pins out. Operation get the pins out. And you will see, obviously, that I'm raw edge everywhere. I'm not turning, I'm not worrying about fraying. In fact, I'm liking fraying. And you can use other things than cloth. You could, if you've got bits of lace, you could even, after you've done all the stitching, go back and sew buttons and beads on if you like that. Be aware, though, that if you want to wind it round a scroll, you see even that one, which is only cloth, is getting really wide. But isn't it lovely, that edge? Sorry. It is. Look, look, look. Shh. Isn't it lovely? Shout out if you think it's lovely. So, there's the last bit. And then I'm going to turn around. And I might just stick something on there, just so I'm not stitching into nothing. And you can even... Like if I put that one on there now, it'll overlap part of it. Do I mind? Not really. So I don't really want the two edges to match, so I'm going to stagger it slightly up there. So I've got, you know, so it's not straight lines. But that's just a little personal preference at the end of the day. And uh, like the one I made with my dad's shirts, that's a lovely way if you've... Um, if you want to remember somebody or you could make make it for somebody with you know uh, with pieces like for example if you had their baby clothes you could make a little scroll with if you wanted to cut up their baby clothes maybe you wouldn't want to I'm just thinking on my feet here but you know me meaningful people make memory quilts so you could do a little memory scroll oh look at that lovely piece no, I know where that came from. <laughs> we actually found this, in, or I found this, in the wall of our house <laughs> when we converted the attic room into our bedroom. There was an old shirt plugging, um, plugging a hole in the wall. And I went, ooh, see, I'm going to make a video about where to get scraps from if you don't have lots of scraps for um, the weekly project next year. And maybe one of the tips will be, if you've got an old stone house, go and look in the walls. So it was all, I washed it, obviously, because it was quite disgusting. Most people would have thrown it straight in the bin, but I was, I like found cloths. I've picked bits of cloth up, you know, when I'm out and about, blowing around the street even. And of course, I always give them a good wash. And I think this one was already quite grungy, but I think I did rust print it as well. I put rusty stuff on it and left it for a bit damp. But that's where that came from. A little found cloth. A little foundling cloth. 
but in a sense that's a memory because that reminds me of um well it is a memory not in a sense it reminds me of when we were renovating well we're still renovating to be completely honest after five years we're not done but um when we were making our bedroom and i found the old shirt stuffed in the wall And I also like that that's got already the stitching in from where it got pulled out of something else. Although I can't remember what it was. It looks like it was a bit of log cabin. Probably I make a lot of log cabin blocks. Um, that also will be one of the weeks. It may well be the first week actually. I've been thinking about it. The first week in the project next year might be log cabins. We'll see. We'll see. So, and there's my little bit that didn't want to lay down, so now I'm going to make him, I'm going to make him behave. So you just want little overlaps, but it's, you know, it's nothing, it's, it's for the, the whole point is doing it, so don't, absolutely don't stress about it being perfect or anything of that nature. Just make sure the little bits of cloth are attached to the backing cloth that is all you're aiming for if there's somewhere a gap or when you look at it later if there's a bit that you don't find pleasing just sew another bit of something over the top no harm done and i'm nearly back to the other end when i get my little piece to behave am i still in the frame yet it's peaceful in here this morning because the cat and the dog don't tell my husband because he'd do his nut. Are both sleeping on my bed, on our bed. So they're not supposed to, well the cat, obviously you can't stop the cat. He's a law unto himself. The dog's really not supposed to be there. But she was so peaceful and I thought, well rather than them in here wrestling, ticking about on the laminate flooring, which does come out on the video, I have now realized hope that's not annoying when that happens. I thought I'll just leave them be. I'll just leave them be. Shh, don't wake them. Don't poke the bear. Right, I'm back to the beginning. I'm just going to go through to the back and just do one little back stitch on the back just for fun. This invisible base, by the way, um, is nearly, well it's not impossible, but it's really hard to get out. So it really is a basting stitch that you intend to leave in because of the back stitch, every little back stitch locks it. There we go. So there's my first little. Get that bit of frayingness off there. My first little um, length, which looks like not much at this moment, to be completely honest. Um, and I would, in general, I my my process is to ba base the whole length, like I said, and then roll it on its scroll, put it in the bag, and then have it there ready for when I want to stitch on it. And I like to have several because, I don't know, it's variety, isn't it? Variety is the spice of life. So then I'm just going to dip in here, and I'm almost at random going to carefully choose. No, I'm going to pull out. Let's have that green. That's a nice long bit of green. That's a bit, no, that's a bit too long. <clears throat> and often there is only one bit of floss and I like to use two two strands you know embroidery floss that's six stranded is that one that's one but that's quite long so I'm just going to double him up but if I only had one shorter length of a color I might just put another color with, with it either a similar color or a completely different color and then you get a kind of variegated thread effect so I really don't worry about as long as I've got some thread in my needle I don't really mind what thread it is let's put it like that if you double up embroidery floss I find it much better to thread the two cut ends through the eye um, than just thread it through you know just thread one single end through and not the two ends there because if I find if I do that second thing one strand invariably gets longer than the other and then it gets all tangly so I don't know if you found that or found that to be a problem, but if you have, then maybe try doing that. So thread your two cut ends through, so you've got your double ends through. And then I just literally, actually usually I leave a bit of space at the end so that I can decide later if I'm going to attach it to the spool. I haven't, <coughs> sorry, I haven't done that here, never mind. And then I just stitch. 
I just stitch. I don't like this needle, it's a bit big. I would, of course, get a nice needle that I like to stitch with because it's just, like I said about the process, have I got a nicer needle here? Oh, my needle cushion is downstairs. They're all great big ones. Is that one better? Oh, I'll just suffer. I'll just suffer on your behalf. And then it's just stitching. Whatever you want to do. Whatever colour you want to do. You can go, oops, you can go all the way along one line and then come back and start the next line. I do my lines in general, they happen to come out I think slightly less than a quarter of an inch. I don't sort of plan that, that's just how they how they happen. Um, but you know, you, you can do whatever you like. You can do tiny stitches closer together or bigger stitches further apart or combination or but the, the point is to just enjoy the process and that's the only point of these little things. And then when they're done, when they're complete and that you've come up with a way to attach them around their spools with a button or a tie or something, they're just lovely just to hold in your hands and every now and then to look at. And the other thing that I get out of them as well is because I'm really using random threads out of my tin, you get some surprising colour combinations that you like that maybe wouldn't have occurred to you. And it's a little bit like this, the same principle as with the stitch journals. When you're making something that really doesn't matter in, in the sense of the finished article, you're not afraid of making a mess or making a wrong choice. You just do, you just make, you just stitch. And um, in that way you can make some quite nice discoveries. I did one in one of my stitch journals a long time ago and I always said to myself I must go and do that but bigger, something more with it. And it was a sort of a nine patch, you know what a nine patch is if you're a quilter. So it's a little a square made of nine patches, so three by three. And I used random scraps for the nine little squares of really quite bright colours for me. And when I put them all, and they were not colours I would have chosen if I was making something proper, you know, like a cushion or a quilt or something like that. Um, but because it was my stitch journal, I just picked out these nine random squares and put them together. And I really liked it. And there was like lime green and shocking pink and orange and I don't know what other colours now off the top of my head. I must look that out. But that's what I mean, that principle of just making something without any pressure. So now I'm to the end of my... And now I'm just, I would just turn around at this point. Go in and then come up the next line. Yeah, make, making something without any pressure and you make some discoveries. It, it kind of makes you brave in a way. I like to stagger my lines of stitching so that the stitches are not, you know, all lined up. But again, if you want to line all your stitches up, I'm not going to tell you it's wrong because it isn't. So you get the idea. And also be aware of um, the different cloths where they're overlapped, how they feel, how they feel to stitch through. This little piece of old shirt that came out of our wall is quite tough. Probably rust printing it as well didn't help. Because although when I've rust printed, I neutralise as best I can with washing soda. So again, rust is quite um, acidic. And I give it a really good wash. And I make sure there's no actual metal left in there. Only the, you know, the stain of the colour. Maybe rust dyeing and printing is something I'll get into at one point as well when I can be outside because that's definitely an outside job. It's messy, messy, messy. And I am also thinking ahead in my mind now that my hands are so <laughs> public. Because when I'm um, eco dyeing, rust printing, doing things like that, my hands are absolutely disgusting for days after a session. 
because no matter how I scrub them, even with lemon juice or, you know, something like that. So I don't like to wear gloves unless I'm doing something really nasty. Um, so I might have to rethink that, otherwise you're going to be looking at black hands. Ooh, nearly to the end of the thread. How long can we make the thread go? And that probably wouldn't be nice looking at my grubby black hands in such close up. I'll probably just do one more stitch. I don't I really don't like this needle. And that's maybe an important point as well. Find a needle that you like. You know, find find materials that you like. Don't don't work with things that are unpleasant. We're doing this for pleasure. We don't want the tools and the materials to be fighting us. It's not nice. It's not nice at all. And then I just leave my tail sometimes, or I might trim it back a bit. It depends. And then I just get another colour. And I have that pink. I just pull it out of my nest. Can you see my nest? My Vimto tin. The proper way I think to say it is Vimto, but in the north for some reason they put in a P. Vimto. And they say it like that. Can I have a glass of Vimto, Granny? I did used to talk like that when I was much younger. Is that two? That's also two. I don't even know why I've got Shocking Pink. I'm sure I haven't bought it. Although I was very lucky before I left England to be given a great big bag of embroidery threads from um, a woman I knew. And they'd belonged to her mum. And this, the woman I knew did do textiles but only machine work. So she had no use for hand sewing floss. She gave me this great big carrier bag full some full skeins, but also a lot of bits. She said, oh, there's a big tangly mess in there, but I thought you could sort it out. And I've got it here in a big tub. And I, oh, my thread nest is getting a bit light. I go and pull off some of the tangly mess. <clears throat> oh, my knots come right through. Naughty knot. Naughty knot. <clears throat> so I have been very lucky about being given things. But I do find as well that if you put the word out that you're, you know, a good home for such things, then um, people are usually happy to get rid of stuff and for it to go to a good home, especially in the case of that, that lady who's uh, belonged to her lovely mum. And now I'm using it. And hopefully her mum would have appreciated that as well. I know I will when my time comes, if that's where all my stuff goes. <clears throat> I'm so sorry. <clears throat> Before I start videoing, I have a good cough and clear of my throat in the hope that I can make it through. And um, not annoy you all. I do my best. I'm doing my best here. And you're all very kind. No one's complained yet about the coughing. I really can't help it. So, there you go. Get the idea. But now I see that red and pink against that neutral background, I do quite like it. And now I'm thinking maybe what it just needs, because I can probably squeeze one more line of stitches in there, is... Um, a complementary colour, so that would be a blue or a green, you know, along there just to balance those. And that's part, for me, of the, the med meditation. It's making decisions and at the same time a little bit going with the flow. So that's how I make those. So that's the start of that one and what I would do with it now. Often, another tip, sorry, digress again, is um, sometimes it's... I don't know if you have this, I know I certainly have it sometimes, not that often, but sometimes, where I feel blocked, I, I can't pick up something to work on. I just I kind of have a mental block, like I don't want to sew, which sounds bizarre because I love, I love sewing. But some days, you know, because of other stuff going on in life or whatever, and although you know that it will make you feel better to do it, you can't take that first step. So often what I'll do with things, and being careful if you have small children or animals around the place, 
I will leave that like that with the needle threaded and some thread still ready to go and the stitch is half made and then I'll put that to one side in my in my rice bag you know tied up tight so the cat or the dog can't get hold of it and stab themselves and then it's much easier then to just pick that up finish the stitch and you've taken the first step and you're away just a little something a little trick that I found for when I'm blocked now I said I would show you oh before I do that I did want to find one I've attached at the other end have I attached this one just don't mind oh no <laughs> I'm going to have to put them all back on in a minute. That will keep me quiet for a bit. I'm sure there must be one that's been attached. Has this one been attached? I really can't remember. Please be attached. Yes, there you go. He's attached. So all I've literally done is just wrapped it round and taken some really sort of utilitarian type stitches there just to hold it. And it will pull round like that. So when you start winding, you have to hold it still. You could, if you really wanted to, put some um, little dab of PVA glue or something on the spool and then you wouldn't even have to stitch. You could just glue on the first turn, you know, to there. So you could do that. Or you could just not attach them at all and just keep them, keep them wound on. And actually the process of rolling and unrolling them also I find very therapeutic. I just like to feel cloth under my fingers, you know call me strange I don't mind so I won't do all that now because that's not probably very interesting to watch um oh I was going to maybe do this shall I do this I think I'll just twisty tie this together I've got a little bit of sari silk ribbon and a little strip of greenish colored cloth and I'm just going to do the cloth twining. There's a whole video about cloth twining. And I'm going to do it quite tightly because I want it quite thin so it will go around my button. Because I don't want to cut off that lovely fluffiness from the sari silk ribbon. So I'm just going to whip it. A few people have said um, that if you've got arthritis in your hands or any other hand issues, it is quite hard to do. I'm so sorry for you if you struggle with your hands. I have very mild arthritis beginning in my left hand, um, but it's, you know, I hardly notice it, only if it's really damp or I've done a lot of, I've done a lot of weeding off and my hands ache from pulling weeds. Um, but what I do if I'm gonna make a lot of this and my hand starts cramping, I do, I call it finger yoga. Basically just stop every now and then and. Um, you know, give your hand a bit of a stretch. But I have, you have my deepest sympathies if you have hand issues, truly. I really feel for you. And also, um, be careful not to kind of, you know, really clamp onto it. It's not, you can hold it really gently. When I first started crocheting, which wasn't that long ago, I knitted since I was a little girl, but I never really crocheted until um, a few years ago. I had the same thing with crochet, you know, holding the, the wool over my hand for crocheting. I, I got cramping in my fingers until I found a way. So maybe there is a way of holding it that'll work for you. Anyway, so there's my rather fluffy little loopy thing. I'm just going to see this button's got a nice long shank, so think it'll work around my button. So I'm going to just lay that down, hope it doesn't all come untwisted state. And I'm going to sew my button on. I'm just going to, see I left a little bit of, of uh, sheet with nothing on it, so I'm just going to double that over just to make it a bit sturdier to support the button. And then I'm just going to sew the button on there like that through all that. I'm going to use this bit. <clears throat> I might double it up. I might do what I just told you not to do. And double it up and tie the two ends together. But for a little button, hopefully, I'll get away with it. So I'm sure you all know how to sew on a button. I'm just going to do a couple of stitches 
first of all where the button's going. I trim my little tail because he's going to poke out. I'm going to go through my shank and make sure he is go up there, somewhat central. Come through to the back and not pull it towards me so you can't see. Again, it's a balance between you being able to see and me being able to see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is a bit short. I shouldn't have been lazy. I should have got new thread. But we'll see. And if it comes off at one point, do you know what? I'll just sew it back on. And that'll do. That'll do, pig. This button's so nice, it is possible at one point that I shall steal it off there and put it onto something else. I don't know. We'll see. Maybe it will stay there forever. Right, just got away with it. <clears throat> so now I'm going to see where I want to attach my loop. Wind it back up. Go on. There you go. So my loop, I don't want all that, I will trim that, I think. Maybe I won't, maybe I'll just do a knot. So what I'll do is I'll put the loop round the button. No, yes, I'm going to do that first. I'm going to make a little knot at the other end. Come on. Get both ends through. Pull them super tight. And I'm gonna I'm gonna leave that like that. We're trimming things off to be even. Things don't have to be even. And um, it just needs to be slightly further back than it should, if you see what I mean, so that there's a bit of a bit of tension in it. So it will need to go, let's say there. Now obviously the tightness that I've wound the scroll will affect whereabouts it goes, so it's not an exact science by any means. I'm just going to put a button in like that to mark the place. And that was a result because I didn't pin it to the next layer down. Now I will need to get some other thread. Thready thread, thread. What shall we use? I'll use some of this green. I'm going to cut some off because it's too long. Too long. Now, where did I just put that needle that I was using? Do you know? Did you see what I did with it? It must be in a needle cushion. Right. Come through from the back. Because I'm keeping you hanging on and waiting. Well, you can, you know, go away and despair. Despair of me. But if you want to see the darn sheets, on the scroll, which I can see. I'll show you in a minute. I'll just go through once more. And that will do, pig. That'll do, pig. <clears throat> there we go. And that looks quite cute, doesn't it? And I quite like the jaunty little ends. So that's that one finished off. And now I shall clear have you had a good look at him? Have you seen him enough? Um, clear the decks. Clear the decks a little bit and show you this beastie beast. Now these were, if you haven't watched the Stitch Journal video, I talked about it in part two of that, which is that long rambly hour and I don't know how many minutes of me basically blanket stitching and wittering. Um, finishing off my stitch journal, I talked about these sheets that I was given by a friend of a friend. Um, who she bought a house here in France and there was a linen cupboard stuffed with sheets and a lot of them were really old and stained and, you know, not fit to be used as bedding anymore. 
And um, my friend said that I would be interested. So I went round there and she gave me all these lovely sheets. And when I got them home, you see they're all different kinds. That's Matisse, that's cotton, I think. That might be linen. That's a very coarse weave cotton. But in them, I hope you can see because they're white, there were all these darns. Can you see the darn? So I'm, I cut them all out of all this huge, great stack of sheets. There's another one. There's a little, I think that's a laundry mark, 44. And I patched them, depending on what size they were, into these little small squares. There's another mend there. See, some are really, that's a really rudimentary and that's quite fragile. See my finger through it, mend. And then coming to this, look at this one now. See how fine that is. Can you see that? And there's another quite rudimentary mend. Now, like I said, I did wash them, but they were so that that hasn't come out. But it's it's clean. It's just stained with a, um, a monogram on it. Which I really struggle sometimes to read these monograms. I just scroll through so you can admire the darnedness. You see all the darns. And I, I use black thread deliberately, so that they sort of made little frames. And I just piece them together with, I um, like doing English paper piecing. So they're all, there's a P. So I put in everything that had a mend in it. That, there's a teeny tiny mend in that. Teeny, right there by my thumbnail. There's a huge great mend there, but I think, yeah, that's done by machine. I just find it fascinating. I was thrilled. I, I mean, I was thrilled to get so much cloth given to me. Well, I, the lady said she didn't want anything. I took her a bottle of um, sparkling wine and um, a box of chocolates, and she was overwhelmed with that. But to me, it was just so much treasure. But to find all these darns as well, there's another end that's a bit grubby, but like I say, I've washed it. Another darn. I did count them, I can't remember. I think there's 40 something individual men's. There's another little um, monogram. Teeny, look at that, teeny tiny darn. Cat hair inside, how did cat hair get inside it? And there's quite a big, I can almost imagine a young girl's done that was her first attempt at a darn. But it's just all the hands that have worked on these sheets over the years. And there's some machine mending and some hand mending side by side. And that's the end. And it's permanently attached to this rather whopping scroll. So that's my collection of old darns. <laughs> So I hope that was interesting and I hope that you will have a go at the um, meditation scrolls if that's something that you think you would like. It's a, a nice little warm up thing to have as well if you want to start stitching on something um, important, you know, something that you want to be nice. Because you do get into a stitching flow so you could use it, you know, like an athlete doing stretches before they ran a marathon. You could do a couple of rows on your stitch meditation scroll before you went on to your, your actual thing. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a lovely practice to have. Um, so I hope you like that. And I hope you agree that they are quite nice to look at as well. And I look forward to you joining me next time for more Cloth Tales. Thank you. Bye bye.